Yeah, well, uh, thanks everybody uh, for uh, attending the uh, SEDLAC Supply Chain Agility Conference. Um, this session is uh, going to discuss goods to, per goods to person GTP uh, automation. Um, this session will provide an overview of GTP technology and we'll learn how Peapod went through the, the automation selection process from uh, initial investigation through integration into their operations. Uh, session will provide lessons learned, a time frame of the evalu evaluation all the way through successful implementation and the ultimate benefits uh, achieved. So <clears throat> just a side note as the moderator, um, I'll be uh, monitoring the chat box for any questions uh, that you may have and we can uh, either try to interject those as we go or towards the end of the, uh, the session here. So. So with that, I'll uh, introduce our, our uh, panelists, um, Daniel Van Gogh. He's the Director of E-Commerce Network and Fulfillment Strategy for ADUSA. Um, Daniel's worked in the online grocery uh, segment for over 15 years, uh, initially with uh, Ahold uh, Del Hayes subsidiary Albert Heim in the Netherlands, and for the past eight years in the U.S. with Peapod, uh, Peapod Digital Labs, and now ADUSA Supply Chain. His focus has been on developing omni-channel supply chain fulfillment solutions and is currently responsible for developing the e-commerce fulfillment and network strategy for a whole Del Hayes, uh, U.S. grocery brands. And also with us is Drew Forte. He's the uh, Vice President of Sales and Consulting for Swiss Log America's e-commerce retail group. Uh, Drew's got 25 years of supply chain and material handling experience. Um, working closely with Swiss Log's fastest growing retail and grocery consumers, understanding their needs and challenges and helping determine and implement their automation strategies. Also an active member of the uh, industry groups, including work and CSCMP. So with that, I will turn it over to Drew um, and we'll get going. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, as Dave said, Drew Forte working with uh, Swiss Log. If you guys can go to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, who is Swisslog, right? Swisslog is a organization that focuses really on three different sectors with this, within the supply chain, the consumer goods, the retail, and the e-commerce business uh, to consumer side. When you look at us as a whole, we really focus within the manufacturing area, the retailer's warehouse, the micro-fulfillment, and the delivery to the consumer goods. We're a uh, company that provides value all the way through manufacturing to the distribution and really that last mile delivery solutions. Next slide. What type of technologies do we offer, right? When you look at Swisslog, we've got over 2000 projects installed worldwide. Uh, we do different type of technologies that range all the way from pallet shuttles, our power store, it's a high dense, high speed pallet shuttle to pallet stacker cranes, to our shuttle system, the cyclone carrier, uh, mini loads, we do conveyors, we do item picking robots. Uh, we've got our own technology called carry pick, which is a goods to person technology. And we also are the uh, number one installer of the auto store solution that you see on the right hand side. Today's presentation, we got Daniel with us who uh, works with a company, um, ADUSA, that has been uh, implementing micro-fulfillment technologies in one of their facilities. We worked with Daniel and his team to really take a look at some of the different goods-to-person technologies, especially the auto store, and it's what they had selected to roll out to their, to their industry. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel and let, uh, let Daniel talk about what process they went through. Daniel? Thanks, Drew. Um, maybe good to start if we can flip to the next slide with a, a brief introduction of um, Aldelas USA, uh, part of, of Aldelas, uh, an international grocer based in the Netherlands. Um, here in the US, we operate five uh, grocery brands um, and, and are the largest grocery retailer on the East Coast. Um, you can kind of see uh, here on the map, Hannaford in the, in the Northeast, a stop and shop in, in New England and uh, the New York, New Jersey area, uh, giant company operating heavily in, in Pennsylvania, 
um, giant food in the Mid Atlantic, and then Food Lion in the in the Carolinas, and uh, spread out throughout the South a little bit. Um, the 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 brands each have their uh, distinct ownership of their strategy, their uh, um, uh, category management, merchandising, etc. Uh, but we have a few support organizations that help them build out uh, specific pieces of that strategy. So Peapod Digital Labs is our omni-channel commercial support organization that also has responsibility for uh, all customer facing and any commerce IT. Um, I started out as being part of Peapod Digital Labs. We were split off last year into our supply chain organization that um, supports uh, the store uh, uh, operations with, with inbound supply chain, as well as helps the brands su uh, support the brands with, with uh, their um, e-commerce fulfillment strategy, network strategy, uh, those kind of things. So that's, that's my role, kind of the internal consultant to our five grocery brands. And um, we, we specifically wanted to talk about a use case with Giant Company um, who were looking at their Philadelphia market, um, a market where uh, we don't have as many stores uh, as uh, we have in our more rural and suburban uh, regions, but that is very strategically important to the company. And, and we really wanted to figure out a good way to um, uh, approach that market from an e-commerce fulfillment perspective, wanted to be close to our our customer in that market, um, but also uh, um, be aware of, of trends in a market that tell us that, you know, labor is, is uh, more and more scarce and more and more expensive. And so automation was really um, one of the ways uh, that we wanted to go. So if we can advance to the next slide, um, this kind of introduces the, um, the use case for the Philadelphia um, uh, Fulfillment Center. Uh, we were looking for an opportunity to open a fulfillment center um, with goods to person uh, technology located inside of the city limits of Philadelphia. Um, it would surface uh, the, the Giant Company brand and their e-commerce uh, um, brand, Giant Direct. Um, and so what we designed is a, um, a goods to person uh, system using auto store technology that can fulfill 15,000 online orders per week, carry uh, 22,000 SKUs, which is uh, close to being on, on par with what we carry in stores, which is important for us. Um, and the way that that uh, um, worked out is we built an ambient out of store grid for our dry groceries and a chilled out of store grid inside a larger chill box to carry um, our, our perishable groceries. Um, so that's kind of the use case. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is how do we get to this solution and how do we get to work uh, with Swiss Log? So um, to kind of take a step back, if we advance to the next slide, really looking at what are trends in market in the market for a grocery e-commerce. Uh, we've operated in e-commerce for over 30 years, uh, originally through Peapod. Um, here in our Chicago office, we still have floppy disks sitting around that were originally sent to customers uh, uh, that we use to um, have them order groceries through a proprietary platform that they had to use their modems to log into. Um, so we've operated in this space quite a bit, but especially in the last two, three, four years, um, uh, things have, have rapidly changed, accelerated, especially due to COVID. And so... Uh, in addition to that, we're seeing labor scarcity growing and growing. We're seeing wage rates escalate. Uh, we're seeing uh, capacity being constrained due to uh, um, e-commerce demand uh, more than tripling over the last two years uh, driven by COVID. And uh, we've also seen players like Instacart step into the market that have really changed the expectation of customers from what you know used to be the normal uh, in uh, over the last uh, uh, 25 years of, of next day delivery um, to uh, same day delivery to four hour delivery to one hour delivery. And we're now even playing in the space of, of 15 minute delivery with uh, a lot of new startups popping up in, in that space specifically. So it led us to kind of uh, formulate a, a fulfillment strategy. Uh, you know, it feels very, um, you know, uh, bathroom tile uh, wisdom like, but it's sometimes good to, to define really what it, what is it that we need to do to be successful in this space based on those trends in the markets. And um, what, what we have said is we need local flexible fulfillment tailored to deliver efficiency and quality every day. Um, 
I think quality is a given. If, if you're not focused on quality in e-commerce, uh, you will lose market share very, very quickly. Uh, obviously, you are doing for the customer what they're used to do uh, themselves in the store, which is find the best possible product um, and, and get it home in one piece. Um, but given those labor and wage rate uh, circumstances, efficiency is certainly important. And that led us to look at, at automation. Um, but the local and flexible pieces also kind of influence how we looked at that. Um, whereas for um, next day delivery type approaches, you can easily concentrate a tremendous amount of uh, volume and demand in a suburban area where real estate is cheaper, where labor is easily and more, and more easy to get and probably cheaper. Um, but with this uh, increased pressure on immediacy, we really need to be local. We need to be close to the customer. Uh, we need to operate out of our existing assets, which is our grocery stores. So we need to be able to operate on a small footprint and we need to be flexible to fit inside that footprint. Um, we don't have the luxury of a 30 foot clear high, nicely rectangular box with dock doors on two sides. Uh, it needs to fit into the back room of a store um, or, uh, 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 or, 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 uh, more unconventional spaces. Um, so while our Island Avenue project in Philadelphia is one of those nicely rectangular spaces with a higher ceiling, um, we really use that environment to pilot this technology, but our thinking going forward is that, that we should build this into a scalable model that we can put inside of the back room of a store uh, to really enhance the capacity of those stores. Um, so, we try to understand, okay, if, if automation is the way forward and this is how we, uh, how we need to do that, um, what type of automation should we be looking at? Um, and uh, if we flip to the next slide, we, we kind of looked at different applications um, and it's all a bit dependent on how many SKUs do you carry? Um, what is the order volume that you're looking at? So we're, we're saying like below the 3000-ish orders per week, we're probably best off either picking from a store, picking from a manual operation. We have uh, several small operations inside of stores that we call wear rooms. Um, but below that volume, there's really no return on investment for, for automation. And I think that line may, may change over time, but that's kind of how we assessed it uh, in, in the current situation. Um, above that volume, it becomes interesting to automate because that business case is there. And then we think there's a lot of different things um, I believe we just looked at Locus as an example. Autonomous mobile robots, I think, have a, a really important place in the market. But in, in uh, online grocery, with the high uh, volume and high level of throughput and high amount of fast movers, uh, we didn't think that that was uh, going to eliminate enough labor and generate enough throughput for us. Um, Ocado is a big player uh, with their uh, uh, Hive solutions um, that we think is also uh, uh, potentially a good solution, um, but for high SKU range, very high volume, it's those applications of go build something big in the suburb somewhere and then uh, cover a, a large territory, but we believe that um, you can't get to the immediacy you need uh, to play in this space. So we really landed on, on ASRS as uh, what we wanted to look at, um, automated storage and retrieval, as well as the goods to person element of a, a stationary picker at a pick station. Um, and then we think at higher volumes, you can further enhance that with other technology. Um, so flipping to the next slide, kind of looking at um, what exists in the field of ASRS, it, it's, it's evolved a lot. I mean, traditionally, I think multi-shuttles were, were the big thing in that space. We've seen those evolve from the very single point of failure type uh, applications to um, more flexibility, robots that don't just do uh, one dimension, but two dimensions uh, and replace the function of some of the, the lift uh, uh, elements uh, in a, in a multi-shuttle. We believe that the key differentiator for that kind of solution is really a high throughput, high volume environment. Um, then there's top access hives, Ocado as an example, Auto Store being the other one, uh, where we think that one of the key differentiators there is the storage density you get uh, from it. Um, the fact that you don't have aisles, that you don't have wasted space, but that everything is very dense. Um, obviously, also only works in an environment where you have a certain Pareto curve uh, of your demand um, that not everything is fast moving uh, and you'll have to account for that a little bit in your design. Um, and then lastly, uh, kind of the next generation ASRS uh, heavily using um, uh, AGVs uh, that eliminate single points of failure, gives you a lot of flexibility in your footprint. 
um, where AGVs move totes around and uh, in some cases also retrieve those totes from the storage uh, area, or sometimes there's multiple functions. Um, the key differentiator there being flexibility. Um, and so we've, we've kind of seen ASRS evolve in those different directions. I think those directions all are starting to converge a little bit too. Um, and, and, and we believe that, you know, next gen will, will become more prevalent, but it's also still pretty much in an infancy uh, uh, stage still. Uh, so having uh, kind of done a lot of research, we visited about 10 different players in this space, traveled the world to see applications and talk to everyone. We, we started defining what's important for us, given the fulfillment strategy we defined, given the learnings that we have out of this research, what should we look at to score different solutions appropriately to, to find what, what will work best for us? Um, so obviously driving productivity, uh, we needed to double or triple the productivity versus our manual operation for it to make sense financially and for it to make sense to address those, those labor and, and wage rate uh, challenges. Operational flexibility, a lot of that has to do with IT integration and how we can leverage part of our own systems versus uh, third party systems to get the best out of both worlds. Um, operating on this smaller footprint so that you don't have to have a, a, a nicely sized large rectangular box with 30 foot of, of ceiling height, uh, but you can utilize those smaller spaces or oddly shaped spaces a lot better. Um, that's the design flexibility piece and, and the, with the small footprint come, also comes like storage density being very, uh, very important versus maybe if you have more space is less of a, of a an element to focus on. Built-in redundancy is a, is a big one. I think we found that if you shrink down multi-shuttles, for example, and they're on a small footprint, um, their inherent single points of failure become more and more uh, of a challenge. Um, uh, if you have a very large high throughput environment with multi-shuttles, you'll have the same skew in multiple aisles and at multiple levels. And so if a shuttle goes down temporarily, it can still access that skew. Um, but if you have a very small footprint, you can't uh, easily do that. And you also can't afford to have 24 seven maintenance on site, given uh, the fact that, that um, the sales throughput is not there. So um, built in redundancy of the system uh, was also very important for us to look at. And then maturity of the solution, maturity of the IT environment, maturity of the uh, software stack and approach, all those things are, are important uh, to look at as well. So um, if we flip that to the next slide, we applied all those factors and scored solutions we ultimately ended up as auto store as, as the solution we wanted to uh, pursue. Um, we spoke to auto store as part of our visiting all these solutions and visiting reference sites and, and those kind of things. We, we felt that given uh, all the other players, the financials were most advantageous, the, the inherent redundancy of having a grid of multiple tens of robots and one robot failing doesn't mean the whole uh, solution comes down um, was very important for us. Uh, and then the design flexibility, uh, literally being able to adjust to different shapes and sizes of spaces was was quite important for us as well. And, and um, Daniel, just, uh, just jump in just real quick on your, you know, the flexibility piece um, that you're mentioning. You know, the, I think that's one of the, the, the great things about all these solutions that you looked at is, you know, thinking about, you know, you're, you got to land on something, right, for go live and whatever that business growth objective is that you're trying to meet. But then, you know, also plans for supporting future growth. Um, can you talk just a minute on, you know, the how that how important that was, I guess, for you know your selection, and then relatively speaking, right? Because obviously there's more capital involved, possibly, and but um, the structure in a lot of cases can remain, but it's really about adding the robots and you know the the ports. Uh, and the auto store concept as, as a way to support that additional growth for years out. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. So there's a, there's a few elements to that. One is if you build a multi-shuttle, you essentially build it once and you build it for future growth. So there's a lot of capital uh, kind of locked up in that, you know, one box that you build. Um, and you may not ramp up your, your volume as quickly as, as uh, uh, would, would allow you to kind of utilize all that capital, right? So the ramp is more challenging with a higher upfront in, uh, investment. Um, with AutoStore, you can uh, choose to build the grid at maturity size, but have less robots on it. 
Um, you can even choose to build the grid at less than maturity size and expand it later. Um, uh, and it can be expanded without halting the existing operation, which is a really uh, big benefit. Um, but being able to even ramp your investment saying, well, we'll start with 40 robots and then in year two, we'll add 10 and then in year three, we'll add 15 more is definitely a way to um, also ramp your investment with volume, which is uh, which creates a lot of flexibility. Yeah, really modular, you know, and flexible to be able to add to support. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just in terms of flexibility to space, right, if you if you look at most multi shuttle solutions, they, they typically grow in like 10 foot increments. Um, if you look at a typical grocery store, you know, our store fleet has an average of about 18 feet of ceiling height. So you're stuck with a, a one 10 foot layer of of um, multi shuttle right now. There's ways to kind of address that. But with auto store, you can build a, a seven layer grid in one location and a 14 layer grid in a different location. And um, you don't have to have that standardized. So that, that gives a, another very um, different flexibility to the use of space for sure. Um, we arrived at auto store in a bit of an unconventional way. I think typically, um, maybe companies go to Swiss log as a system integration, uh, a system integrator or a solution provider and say, you know, we have, we, we want to do this. Can you advise us on what type of uh, technology to use or what type of approach to, to choose? Um, we, we went directly uh, for the technology solution uh, and, and, and then auto store said, and, and you'll need a system integrator. So we really looked at um, who is out there uh, that can integrate um, auto store systems. Um, and we landed on, on Swiss Log as our partner of choice. I think they, as, as Drew said in his intro, they have uh, by far the most experience implementing auto store. I believe they, they've done about half of all worldwide auto store implementations. Um, they had specific um, uh, experience in grocery, which was important to us. Um, but they, they also have a track record of maturity in the IT integration space. And that was very important to us um, because we've seen elements of that um, uh, affecting operations very negatively, uh, if, if not uh, well taken care of. So um, we ultimately uh, looked at various options and chose SwissLog as our, as our partner. Um, and and AutoStore you know, showed that same maturity, right? They've been playing in this space for about um, 30 years. Um, they've ramped up quite a bit. This says over 400 implementations. I believe this slide is, or the, 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 the base of the slide we use is, is more than a year old. I think it's, it's now approaching the 500 implementations. Um, and Auto Store 2 has customers in grocery um, and with, with various different applications. So it, it seemed for us the best, uh, the best approach. Um, and then um, flipping to the, the final slide, it kind of led us to, um, for about a year, work on our uh, Philadelphia facility, which opened on November 8th. Um, that was on time. It was the planned launch date uh, that we set about a year and a half uh, before, uh, and it was delivered uh, under budget which we're quite proud of that typically doesn't happen with uh, uh, projects uh, of this size and scope and scale and, and complexity. So the slide on the other picture on the right is, is an attempt to indicate how many different aspects were involved in this. So obviously uh, lots of IT integration um, that we use all of our internal ADUSA support organizations for, uh, as well as, as, as SwissLog and AutoStore. Um, obviously operations, when it comes to training, when it comes to um, uh, 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 the HR element, hiring, staffing, uh, all of those things, um, the giant company in that now owns and operates and runs the building. And I think we, we managed to, to have a, a very smooth handover to them. Um, and a few things that we're quite proud of in this project is there have not been any IT integration uh, challenges that have caused any kind of impact on the operation. Um, and, and that was something that we really were intentional about pursuing. I think we found a really good cadence with Swiss Log on IT design. We had three week sprints defined. At the end of every sprint, there was uh, uh, intensive testing, which kind of de-risked a lot of the testing at the end. 
um, because you can you can plan for months of testing at the end, but if you find a, a an issue or a challenge, especially if it's a complex one, you have to then go and rework it and test again, and that could easily delay. So we really wanted to de-risk de and and test throughout the project very heavily, uh, and it really paid off. Um, so IT integration went very smooth. The construction side of things. Um, from a, um, how we integrated and connected with Swiss Log and Auto Store was was really positive uh, and and painless. Um, and so we've been running now for about um, four months. Uh, we're still ramping up volume, so we're we're moving volume from all of our existing uh, e-commerce uh, operations uh, into our Philadelphia building. Um, we're we're about on schedule, maybe a little bit behind uh, with that. Um, as the operators are still kind of finding their sea legs and, and figuring out, I think if I would want to point to anything we underestimated, it was probably the training aspect, especially the training aspect of address, addressing any challenges that come with the automation, a big port that gets stuck, a robot that, that is stuck. I think um, if, you, if you look at it from the operator's perspective, perspective, the operators see this as one big machine and it should just work and it should just do its thing. Um, and everything that doesn't work uh, exactly as expected is, is the machine's fault. Um, and while that may be true, we also have to address it. And so we've, we've gone through a few additional training rounds with SwissLog to provide more uh, insight into addressing some mechanical challenges and issues. How can we take things away really quickly so that we can keep flowing. Um, and uh, I think there's there's small disturbances uh, uh, on a daily basis almost that are normal in these kinds of, uh, of environments. And now that we've gotten better at addressing them, we've also created a lot more stability and flow in the facility. So um, we're, we're quite happy with how it operates um, and we're ramping up volume to really make sure that we start to understand how much can the box do? Um, does it get to the design volumes? Does it get to the design productivities, et cetera? And it's very exciting to see it um, perform well. Yeah, so Daniel, um, we're touching on the, the training piece and you know, kind of the before and after. You know, I, we've all been in situations where you, you've got an automation project coming up and you're coming from a more manual position and. Um, anything you can share in terms of the, the communication out to the team, you know, heading into this big project and I'm um, trying to get them comfortable, you know, with, with what's coming. Yeah. I think, like I said, I think it's the piece that we maybe underestimated the most. Uh, and I provided the perspective of the operator, right? It's like this, it's this black mm -hmm. box and it should just always work. Right. I think the perspective of the, the other side of, 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 you know, and, and it's, and it's, how we've talked to SwissLog about it too is like, well, you know, those those operators should be highly focused on doing exactly the right thing because if they do the wrong thing, um, it, it breaks. And what we've what we've really worked on is trying to find the ideal middle ground between those two things. Um, because yes, you want to make sure your operators are trained well, but if there's aspects to a solution like this that require very specific handling. Um, you know, in a, in a labor environment where it's hard to find people, mm -hmm. where it's hard to, to train people, where, you know, you, you have people who um, uh, who aren't PhDs and who aren't like trained to operate complex machines, the, the, the interface to the operators needs to be simple, needs to be straightforward, needs to be foolproof. And so I think, you know, between the perspective of, you know, the, the designer of the machine saying, well, everyone should operate, you know, absolutely 100% perfectly. Um, and if they if they do one thing wrong, the whole thing blows up versus the operator saying, well, the machine should always uh, perform perfectly whatever we do. We, we, we really looked at finding the middle ground, but we really needed to mostly work with our operations leadership and make sure they, um, they understand what it means to operate in uh, an automated environment, um, that it is different from a manual environment that they may be used to, and that there are aspects that uh, are important to pay attention to, um, to make sure things keep flowing, um, which includes, uh, you know, owning some of the day-to-day -day maintenance aspects. And, and once we started putting focus on that, uh, we really managed to get a lot of the disturbances out of the way and, and not impacting um, operations. Um, and I think there's there's something in you know adapting training materials to 
the specific language uh, that that people are used to, the specific level uh, of of people's understanding of of something like automation that that is important. I think um, you know our our goal is, like I said, we we need to scale this uh, in in a way that we can put it in 30, 40, 50 of our grocery stores. And we've we've been talking to Swisslog about you know what is required to scale this, what is required to really get us to a point where where we would drop this in in a standardized way. And I think you know, getting to standardized training materials that that use the right vernacular, that doesn't just work from the machine's perspective, but it works from the operator perspective. Those are all things that we still need to um, uh, work out once we once we start scaling this, uh, because I think those things are are important. Um, so there's there's those kinds of elements that try to ensure that we take operators uh, um, at the management level as well as the execution level along on the ride when it comes yeah. to operating in these environments. And a lot of times that's, that's you know, because it's towards the end of the <clears throat> end of the road before go live, sometimes that gets tightened up the windows and, um, but it sounds like you guys manage through it uh, pretty nicely. So, um, and then the other, the other piece from an IT perspective, right? So we've got, um, you know, great feedback and understand that you guys had a really smooth integration, which is, you know, I would say, I don't say unusual, but there's always challenges there. And I think here we've got the the middleware, right? The Swiss log middleware, is that right? In the in between um, the host and machine level? Yeah, we, we have uh, Swiss log sync software that is running the automation, the conveyor, along with the auto store systems communicating up to ADUSA's, you know, platform. Yeah, so just having that additional piece of the puzzle makes it probably a little bit more challenging, but you mentioned the sprints and making sure testing is is fully vetted out before going to the next step. Um, any other insights you can you can shed on that whole piece of the puzzle? Maybe one of the biggest challenges, even though it went smoothly. Yeah, Drew, jump in here if 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 you uh, would want to add something. I, I would say you know what 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 we tried to set out to do from the start is even though it's a complex environment, make it as simple as possible. Uh, one of the things, and that those were learnings from, from other experiments that we've done, uh, is that we, we would really want to leverage our existing, uh, some of our existing WMS functionality that has been tailored to the grocery e-commerce space, um, which, which isn't necessarily you know, standard, uh, available in a standard way off the shelf or, or in Swiss log systems, but then not, reinvent the whole wheel in um, uh, in a sense that, you know, we, we, we rewrite all sorts of interfaces from uh, our legacy platforms into the automation. So we really leveraged Swisslog Sync uh, um, WMS as kind of the, the go-between. Um, and I think that did allow us to continue to leverage our systems for the most part in, in uh, running order management and warehouse management in the way they do in all of our manual operations, but then leverage uh, uh, sync for uh, uh, the management of the automated auto mm -hmm. store parts and, and really focused on um, making sure that, that those are integrated tightly. I think a, a, a strong focus on um, exception handling is important. You tend to just you know focus on the happy flow, but there's all sorts of situations that can occur uh, that you wanna make sure that you know, in the automated environment, you handle that similarly to what a, a manual operator would do. Um, and I think, you know, we ran into one extreme edge case that wasn't covered, uh, but uh, every other edge case that we could, could think of was discussed and incorporated into the, into the integration approach, which uh, led to very little problems. That's awesome. Yeah, I think Daniel just just added that, right? I think what the key was is what what Swisslog really strives to do for our customers is make sure that IT is interlocked, right? You can put all the automation you want in there, but if it doesn't communicate, it doesn't work. So we would have Daniel. What was it? Every other week, maybe every two to three weeks, we would have IT meetings. We would lay out what the communication looks like, what the application looks like. We would talk through ADUSA, how they want to handle it. We would talk through how Sync would handle it. Then we'd come to mutual agreement on how it would be handled, right? To minimize all the customizations. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we had a document, and I don't remember how big it was, but it was, it was pretty large 
that outlined all of the different use cases that Daniel talked about. So when we went into that implementation, it was documented and we knew, and we were able to test it. We had the team fly out to our corporate office in Newport News. We did a live demonstration of the software. Um, there were a few things that we found that we were able to fix prior to go live. And that's what helped with the seamless go live. Yeah, good approach. All right, well, um, check the Q&A here. I don't think we've got any, any questions right now, but um, yeah, guys, thank, thank you for, for taking the time and, and sharing the success story um, and hope uh, others can, can leverage that information going forward for their efforts. So great to have you guys. And uh, thanks again for sharing your, uh, your story. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks, okay. Daniel. Yeah, thank you very much <clears throat> to our panelists.